Hello and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Gina Borgia and I am so glad you are joining us for today's special event. At National Geographic, we know the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling can change the world. This Explorer Classroom YouTube show connects students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for your questions. Today, our Explorer is Paul Salopek. Paul is a writer and journalist who has traveled to more than 50 countries and has earned most of America's top print media awards. Paul is currently on foot retracing the pathways of the first humans who migrated out of Africa for a decade-long storytelling project called the Out of Eden Walk. Since his journey began in Africa over a decade ago, he has walked over 7,800 miles. Paul is joining us today live from the trail in Shanghai, China, and will provide an update from his recent 1,242-mile journey through Southwest China. But before we get into today's lesson, let's welcome our viewers who registered in advance and have joined us today from around the globe. Our shout outs for today go to DW Babcock Elementary School, IBM E. Montes Elementary School, AC Flora High School, Clark Boulevard Public School, St. Benedict CES, Love to Learn, The Lou Family, O.H. Somers Elementary School, Mill Pond School, Gems World Academy, Pine Knob Elementary, University of Chicago Laboratory School, The Cool School, Summers Knoll School, Mother Teresa Catholic Primary School, First Experimental School of Athens, Palm Beach Day Academy, Higgins Middle School, Our Lady of Lords, Balbarati Public School, Mechanicsville High School, The Thorpe Family, and the Out of Eden Learn Network. And of course, all of our homeschools out there, we are so thrilled to have you all here. And with that, Let's get this Explorer Classroom started. It's time to turn it over to Paul to share his update from the trail. Take it away, Paul. Great, thank you, Gina. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clap here because some National Geographic colleagues have asked me to record audios just to help them out how to do this. Um, and so, yeah, can, can you hear me okay? Is the audio okay? Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today or tonight or wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, talking to you from the Middle Kingdom, from mainland China, um, where I am in the process of, of walking across China from south to north as part of this large, uh, long journey that Gina mentioned called the Out of Eden Walk. Uh, I'm in my ninth year, going into the tenth year. Uh, I walked out of Africa back in 2013. And the reason for this walk is, for those of you who don't know, just to give you a, a, you know, a thumbnail uh, synopsis, is... I'm retracing the ancient migrations of human beings who spread out of Africa back in the Stone Age uh, with the idea of rediscovering the world on foot uh, and trying to slow down uh, my storytelling uh, so that I can uh, talk to people more often uh, at longer uh, lengths, uh, get a bit into their lives, whether they're city people or, or villagers or fisher people or you name it, uh, in order to try to see what does the world look like at boot level at this day and age, so long after the first pioneers, the first discoverers who uh, first discovered the planet for us about 70 to 100,000 years ago? Uh, I've, I've walked through about 18 countries so far, going from Africa through the Middle East, through the Caucasus Mountains, through Central Asia, over the Himalayas, the Western Himalayas, uh, into India and walked across Northern India into Myanmar, also known as Burma. And for the last six or so months, I've been walking north from the Burmese border uh, through China. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today uh, is one of the things that maybe is not that well known about China. Um, when, when, when you say the word China to many people who don't live in China, people in other continents, the main reputation of China is as a commercial giant, as this the factory of the world that's producing, you know, all the consumer products that we consume from electronics to clothing, to cars, to you name it. Um, but I just wanted to share with you today um, how that's not really true, how China is so big and so diverse that it's like walking through many different countries. Um, 
China is many thousands of kilometers long, north to south. My walk through China is going to take more than a year, and it's going to cover more than 6,000 kilometers, which is more than 3,600 miles. For those of you in North America, it's, it's, it's probably farther than walking from Los Angeles to New York. I mean, it's very, very far. Um, and it goes through subtropical climates all the way up to very cold, kind of subarctic, chilly, chilly weather that you might find in northern Canada. And what I'd like to share today, I've asked Gina to show a few images from the trail so far. And before we do, I'll just preface it by saying all of my Chinese friends told me, they said, Paul, you're starting in a very special corner of China that is unlike any other place in China. It is kind of a, a China apart, a China to itself. Um, and the parts that I walk through are two provinces, uh, Yunnan and Sichuan. And uh, with that, uh, Gina, let's go ahead and, and put up the first image and we'll, we'll kind of walk you through the images here. So walking through Southwest China, why is it special? How is it different uh, from the rest of China? Well, to begin with, it's a crossroads. This corner of China um, borders Southeast Asia, it borders South Asia, it borders Tibet, um, and it's been for many, many centuries a uh, crossroads of trade. The old Silk Roads used to run through here, and so you have an extremely diverse uh, group of people um, that have migrated through over time and settled there, and there's layer upon layer of human habitation. And that made it really fascinating. Um, it was like, in some, in some ways, like walking into a new country every time I came into a new valley off a mountain range. Um, this picture here is just give you an example of how it defies the stereotype of hyper-industrialized China, you know, super fast China, um, super uh, urbanized, citified China. The majority of my trail over the last 1,800 kilometers what is that? It's about, you know, more than a thousand miles through Southwest China has been in very open country, uh, ranging from, from villages to agricultural zones to big national parks, big wild mountains, like you see in the background here. And it's sometimes involved walking with cargo horses, as you can see here. Um, this, this photo is of a very beautiful valley uh, canyon on the Yangtze River called Tiger Leaping Gorge uh, in Yunnan. Next image. And so what we see here is a map of mainland China uh, with some of these provinces outlined. Um, you probably, it's too small to see the lettering, but two of the bigger provinces there are Sichuan and Yunnan. And that gives you an idea kind of geographically where I began my journey um, way back in October of last year on the uh, border of Myanmar, which is on the southern border of that map. The next image. And so what you see here is more or less my, my planned route to cross China. It's pretty much a straight line going from the Southwest to the Northeast, going from Myanmar or, or Burma, walking through the heart of the country uh, to the border of Russia, to Siberia, which I won't reach probably until next spring. There's a long way to go. You can see uh, just how far these distances are. Um, that entire line, when you combine what I've walked already with uh, that dash line of what, have, what I have yet to go, again, is about more than 3,500 miles. It's a long, long way. So let's go onward, next image, to talk about the unique Southwestern portion that I've just covered. Next image. It's up, cultural and biologic diversity. Okay. Um, all right, so I can't see this image as a bit of a, a lag. Oh, there it is. Okay, so what what um, makes this corn of China special? Well, there there there's a both a human element and a, a non-human element, a natural element, and they both involve one thing: hyper diversity. Southwestern China is the most culturally diverse corner of China. It has um, twenty six official ethnic groups in it, and that is about half of the officially recognized ethnic groups in all of the country. 
they're packed into this corner of China. At the same time, um, in terms of ecology and the environment, it's also the most biodiverse corner of China. It has environments that range from mountaintops that are glaciated up around 20, uh, 2,000 feet, about 7,000 meters. I mean, that's getting up towards almost, you know, Mount Everest isn't too much higher than that. Really super high, snow covered year round, the kind of landscape you would see with like extreme alpine climbing down to environments like you see in this picture, which is a uh, conifer forest, mixed pine trees and spruce uh, with valleys that go into grasslands, valleys that go into um, um, kind of subtropical rivers where all kinds of fruits and vegetables are grown down into tropical rainforest. Why is this corner of China so diverse? There's a reason that's very, very old, tens of millions of years old. The Indian subcontinent, if, if all of you have, have studied plate tectonics and the fact that, you know, continents drifted around for many millions of years before they created the map that's familiar to us now, and they continue to move just so slowly that we can't perceive it. Well, India slammed into what is today southern China and pushed up a series of mountain ranges, basins and ranges that created kind of an accordion of land. And by doing that, it created this incredibly rugged, diverse topography surface of the land that ranged from snow mountains down to tropical forests. So um, that same principle of, of creating kind of elevational gradients through all these different ecosystems also created a very complicated mosaic for humans to inhabit, right? So as ancient humans migrated through this corner of Asia, some settled along coastal areas and exploited marine resources. Some walked up river valleys into tropical rainforest and, and took up agriculture with tropical crops. Others continued further up towards the Tibetan plateau and became pastoralists, right? Because it got too cold to have um, agriculture. So people um, took up economies that deal with animal husbandry, pushing around sheep, pushing around goats, pushing around yaks. And so the incredible diversity, this kind of mosaic, this tapestry of biology and anthropology that is crammed into this southwestern corner of China ultimately rests on a bedrock of geology, a bedrock of different elevational changes, this maze of river systems and valleys and mountain ranges often running in parallel from north to south with huge rivers running up these valleys. So the effect, as I mentioned before, is that back in the, in the time when there wasn't motorized travel, when there, before the industrial age, when people got around on foot, it was incredibly difficult to get through this landscape. It, it was very laborious. It took a lot of effort to get over these mountains, these high frozen passes down through kind of swampy lowlands. And so that encouraged communities to develop on their own in relatively small geographic areas. So again, think of it as a mosaic. And, and you folks know what a mosaic is, right? It's pieces of colored like ceramic that are pasted together to create a larger portrait. Well, the larger portrait of Southwestern China encompasses a, a really incredible mosaic of cultures, subcultures, languages, dialects, and, and, and histories. Um, you can have people in two valleys that are only one day walk apart who speak completely different languages. Um, this again is kind of uh, a lesser known China, a China that doesn't get uh, written about or seen very often. Next image. Okay, this okay. one is a snowy landscape. Can you see that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I just wanted to throw in a few snapshots of what I've seen walking along the trail over the last six months uh, through this, this edge. And, and think of it as the eastern edge of the Himalaya Mountains, right? The biggest mountain range in the world, um, the highest. This, it kind of starts to taper out in southwestern China. And I had the rare privilege of kind of being able to walk over some of these mountains that not too many people get to, to walk through. Um, so here, this photo was taken at a, at a mountain pass. I think this pass was about 4,200 meters or about, I don't know, maybe close to 13 or 14,000 feet. And you can see in the distance, you know, ranges covered with snow, 
Um, there are permanent snow fields, permanent ice fields, and this is a very inhospitable cold area. Um, I don't know if some of you have heard the, the term Shangri-La. I don't know if some of you are familiar with, you know, with the legend of Shangri-La. There was a novel written way back in the 1930s called Lost Horizon about a utopian kind of mystical uh, community of, of, of people living high in southwestern China who kind of led a kind of a Tibetan Buddhist lifestyle and who lived to 250 years. It was one of these kind of, you know, fantasies of, 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 of El Dorados, of kind of never, never land, you know. Um, and um, it was placed here. This, is, this, this landscape with these very remote communities high up in this crystalline mountains with these ceramic blue skies uh, inspired the writer to kind of place it in this corner of the world. So here is the beginning of the legend of Shangri-La. Next image. It's a, it's a woman in a field. Okay, um, so the next image um, is uh, a tea picker. And so I just wanted to show you the incredible contrast that I've seen in the last six months. This was a hot, steamy day. This is way down, this is like thousands of feet or you know a couple thousand meters below that last picture where the landscape has changed, the colors have changed, the, 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 the economy has changed from, you know, herding yaks to, to growing tea. This is a tea plantation. It is literally like another world. And as I mentioned before, because they're kind of jammed together by geology, these contrasts come very close together. You know, there's not like a, a, a slow fading away of one language in one culture into another. It's very abrupt. You, you go up one mountain pass, and as soon as you come down to a village on the other, they're speaking a different language. Next image. And this is to give you some example of sort of the, some faces here. I just wanted to give you some faces of the different cultures and subcultures and ethnic groups. Um, these people um, are ethnic Tibetan um, with a little ethnic Pumi mixed in though. So here's a mixture of two different subcultures at a very remote uh, village that lives by timber you know, lives by logging. And you can see in the background, there's even a log cabin. I mean, the log cabin could look like something you'd see in Canada, right? Or Colorado, but here it is in Southwestern Canada. And this, this beautiful um, woman is 89 years old. Um, she is the daughter of, of yak herders. Um, and her, her granddaughter there lives in a big city, has a modern life with all the video games you can pack into a, a, mob, uh, a smartphone. And they live in different worlds, right? The, the granddaughter had come to visit grandma here in this picture. And so next image. And here is a, a, a woman who walked with me for a couple days um, in Yunnan. She is from the Nashi community. Uh, the Nashis are famous because they have a unique ideographic language, a writing system. It looks kind of like the hieroglyphics of Egypt. They're kind of drawn images. That's very, very rare um, and almost disappeared from everywhere else in the world. And they still preserve this. Um, the Nashi also um, have a shamanistic tradition. Uh, they, they, they worship nature um, and they have ceremonies for curing people, ceremonies of purification um, that involve dancing all night, um, that involve going into trances, chanting until uh, the, uh, the shamans go into trances. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a remarkable kind of remnant of a much older way of life. Next image. And this woman is, um, this is a, a beautiful photograph by my walking partner, um, Zhang Hongyi, of, of a woman from the Mosul culture. And this culture, of which of a group of people who live in these very rumpled um, forest covered hills on the border between Yunnan and Sichuan are matrilineal. Uh, how many of you know what that means, matrilineal? Um, it, it has to do with, with gender dynamics, right? About whether um, men or women have kind of economic control with how much power they wield in their societies. Well, this is one of the rare cultures anywhere in the world where women still maintain a great deal of power within their community. Um, the name is passed down through the woman's, the mom's name. The mom's name is what's passed down, not the father's. Um, women have 
considerable say in ownership of land, which is unusual for many um, rural and agricultural societies around the world. Um, women in Mosul culture um, can divorce um, at any time and there's no stigma attached to it like there is in many agricultural societies. So again, the reason I'm, I wanted to share these images with you is to show you how astonishing it was to walk through, again, this, this kaleidoscope of human diversity. Next image. So given how complicated it is, and I'm not even on right today, my friends, I don't have time to go into the history of this corner of China because it, it, it itself is complicated. It's waves of invasions from the North, empires from the South moving up. Um, um, it, it's, it's very complex um, wa empires that are kind of washing back and forth across this crossroads vying for commercial control of these trade routes through Asia. But it's complicated enough just to kind of describe to you the biodiversity of all these different ecosystems that are stacked you know, vertically on top of each other from sea level almost to 22,000 feet. The incredible um, um, pastiche of, of different cultures. How do you possibly, I'm a storyteller, how do you possibly tell a story about this that actually hangs together, that actually makes sense, that doesn't confuse people more, right, than, than necessary? So I decided I'm going to use the ancient trade routes that go back at least 2,200 years to kind of sew these stories together. I'm going to use my feet, I'm going to use my body as a needle that pulls a thread through the landscape, stitching all these subcultures and cultures and languages and landscapes together in my wake behind me. And, and I think that is the mechanism that I settled on to kind of to try to make sense out of this, this very complicated and amazing uh, corner of Asia. Next image. And so there are basically three kind of um, different eras or different layers of, of, of commercial uh, traffic through this part of Asia. The oldest by far is the old Silk Roads. They go back more than 2000 years and they brought things like silk, like um, porcelain, uh, uh, um, they trafficked in elephant tusks, they trafficked in gold, they trafficked in bronze. And, and the people who traveled them from this part of what is today southwestern China were, were moving um, commercial goods down into what is today Burma, maybe all the way down to what is today Thailand. It was certainly moving into northern India. And in some cases, their products ended up as far away as Afghanistan. So that's one layer. So I was following, I was talking to archaeologists, I was talking to Chinese historians saying, hey, where, where can I walk through these two provinces where I can actually step on top the footsteps of these ancient traders who went through here 2000 plus years ago. So that's one layer. The next layer is um, what's called the Tea and Horse Road. And that's kind of a, a local branch of the Silk Road in Southwestern China that specialized in certain commodities, in this case, tea and horses. So tea from Sichuan, tea from Yunnan, was traded often um, into Southeast Asia or Northern India. Um, and what you have here are pictures of gentlemen carrying these, these long kind of canisters on their backs. And what those canisters are, are bamboo kind of, uh, um, I don't know even what to call them. They're kind of like tubes in which sticks or rather bricks of compressed black tea are pushed and then packed on top their backs. And, and that is the third layer specifically of, of foot travel trade that I followed. So it was the Silk Road, the tea horse trail. When the, the horse part is that Tibetans traded horses back to China in exchange for Chinese tea. Um, but this last one was just the tea trail itself of, of, of people carrying things on their back. They weren't using yaks, they weren't using mules or, or donkeys. They were, they were man hauling this stuff into Tibet. These loads were sometimes up to 150 pounds. We're talking like, you know, 70 kilos. In some cases, that was as much as the, as the porter that was carrying it. They walked for weeks. Um, they covered hundreds of kilometers over mountain passes that were, you know, glaciated. And they sometimes did this barefoot, often being paid just in rice, right? Very difficult lives. So I tried to honor the memory of these ancestors um, by also following the footpaths of the tea of the tea porters along the tea trail between 
Sichuan and Tibet. Next image. So I'm just gonna show two short videos and now the, the videos may be a little bit um, jumpy. Um, it's just part of the technology is hard to transfer, but at least you'll get some of the images and maybe some of the audio. And I'm gonna show you two. The first one is to show you one extreme of the walking environment in Southwestern China, which is kind of subtropical and green and dense and lush. And then the second one will be very, at, at very high altitude. So let's see what, if we can get this first one going. This is uh, crossing the Lanchang River Gorge. Um, and that's, that's kind of an upper headwater um, of a river that flows all the way down into Southeast Asia that you might've heard of called the Mekong. So let's, let's see if we can get this to work. In my walking part, Yunnan. And what you see there in the distance is the new China that is starting to intrude into this remote southwestern corner of China that's less developed. And we're talking high-speed rail lines, super highways, um, um, high-speed internet, it's all coming in. So there you saw kind of an intersection of the ancient and the new, two, two kind of very different forms of... So we can show the, the next um, video, Gina. Okay. And this is 1,500 miles north. On at an elevation of five, uh, let's see, 1,500 meters, <clears throat> excuse me, 1,000 meters. It's magnificent. We're coming down the western watershed of the passes near Gongashan and what you see in the distance, that far line of white snow, that's the Tibetan Plateau. That's the road to Tibet. So there we have it. Uh, Gina, we can, we can come back on now. Uh, that's the end of the, the PPT. So that shows these two um, radically different environments and the extraordinary, extraordinary privilege it's been over the last months to be able to connect them with my feet about 30 inches at a time, which is what my, my footstep is, a lot of them. So with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the larger project or about this particular corner of Asia. Wow, thank you so much. We're coming to the end of our time here. So Paul, I wanted to ask one last question. Do you have any general advice for the young explorers out there listening today? Yeah, well, it would be the one that we just talked about. It's a good, that's a good segue to the last kind of closing statement is, is even, in, you know, we've come through a difficult time, many of us uh, with this COVID pandemic, um, a lot of you have had your school you know, sessions interrupted by having to, to have remote learning. You've been, you know, isolated in your homes. You've had your normal lives disrupted. I just just remind you that um, most of the most significant journeys take place in your mind. They take place up here, and you don't need to walk across the world um, to go find new discoveries, to come across new ideas to make connections that are meaningful with other people. You can take a walk around your neighborhood or your block and you will find the same kind of discoveries that I'm finding. It's, it's universal. So my advice is um, be curious, follow your curiosity um, and try not to be afraid. Take precautions, 
you know, be careful always, but try not to be, don't let fear dictate your life, right? And if you can, if you can keep these two things going, boy, there is no trail that will be closed to you. That's my advice. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for taking the time to share about your amazing journey with us. And we know it's a little late where you are, so we so appreciate your time. My pleasure. Great to see everybody. Great to hear your questions. Thank, Thank you for joining. Thank you, students, so much for your thoughtful questions today. And thank you, teachers, for making things like this happen for your class. You can continue to follow Paul's storytelling at outofedenwalk.org. And teachers, be sure to visit the learn.outofedenwalk.org to dive into more exciting learning opportunities for your students. We are nearing the end of our school year here at Explorer Classroom with only five shows left. So you don't want to miss what we have in store before school is out. Tomorrow, we'll be joined by Explorer Gretchen Johnson. She's going to teach us about the hidden history of St. Helena Island, followed by a special field event with Allison Cusitiello live from an expedition on Mount Logan in the Yukon. And next week, we'll hear from Explorer Aaliyah Pierce to learn all about the power of oral storytelling. You can register your student group for a shout out during any of those events and a chance to be up here on screen with us at natgeoed.org 